Every single day, you've got to understand, every single day they were just telling me another piece of bad news. I was literally expecting to get to the exit door and for them to be running down to say, oh, we've got to pull you back in because something else has gone wrong with you. So it wasn't until I hit that London street and I felt the cold air. Oh, this is good. This is good. Uh, you know, it's good to be alive kind of thing, right? Those who live a high-performance life have figured out how to consistently bring their best, their A-game, to the most important areas of life. On the A-Game Advantage podcast, you'll get to peek inside the mind of the world's highest performing individuals so you can learn and model the mindsets and systems that allow them to bring their A-Game every day. With your host, Elliot Rowe. Welcome to another episode of the A-Game Advantage. I'm your host, Elliot Rowe. This episode is brought to you by Primed Mind. This is my mindset app designed to prime your mind to perform at its best when it matters the most. To download and try it out for free, just visit agameadvantage.com slash primed. Now, I'm very excited to bring you our guest this week. His name is Vic Hoffey, and his story is simply amazing. Now, Vic is a martial arts expert. You could say that martial arts is his life. He has British titles in taekwondo, kickboxing, weapons fighting, and he's also a master in kung fu. Now, over the last year, he had some very significant health issues, and he actually ended up in a coma. Now, through that time, he was able to use his martial arts training and mental toughness to recover in a way that is really quite extraordinary. And this is one of my favorite stories of mental toughness I've really ever come across. And obviously, I work in the industry of mental toughness. So that gives you an idea of what this story is going to be like. So I want him to tell it in his own words. So let's give Vic a call and you can hear him explain this incredible story. Vic, oh, welcome to the show. Really, really good to have you on. Now, you have the most amazing story, and I think it's just completely wrong that it hasn't gone viral yet. So I wanted to have you on to share this as like story of mental toughness and martial arts and taking control of your life with everyone. So, so tell us about it. Share your message, sir. All right. So uh, 2017 was a great year. Well, actually, first, thanks for having me on the show. <laughs> right. Yes, yeah, so 2017 was a great year for me. Uh, I hit a lot of particular uh, markers that I had business-wise, relationships, um, physically, um, martial arts-wise, the whole lot. It, it was really good. Um, and uh, I decided to, well, a friend of mine had pressured me into turning up to his stag. He goes, you know, we've got to do it. I said, fine. So I went there, took a little time off, came back. I started to not feel right i started to get cramps all over my body it was a uh, it was a strange feeling next day i went to the hospital because i i'd recognized i'd i'd had a, a condition before which basically it's it's a blood condition and it's, it seemed like it came back and it was more severe so went to the hospital and and next thing i know my right leg the body was force feeding the leg full of fluid and it was literally trying to tear out of the muscle and that was that that i went in on uh, let me see for a ride on a friday on a Saturday, the, the doctors took me out of the, the bed and said, look, we've got to do surgery. It's a life-saving surgery. We've got to put you in. They done the surgery, which involved them cutting me open from hip to knee to relieve the pressure on the leg um, because the leg was contracting so hard, it was actually crushing the bones. So they opened the leg up and I woke up from the surgery. And you went through kidney failure, basically. And so we've got to have you put on a dialysis machine. And I'm thinking, shit, this has ruined my plans for Monday. You know, <laughs> uh, and then uh, I started to feel cramps and pain go all up the left side of my body. They, they were shocked because of the speed that it was happening. Um, if you can imagine, like the Incredible Hulk, you know, when when he's tear in the old show where where he was bursting through his his trouser legs and everything, um, it's pretty much like that. I went back into surgery, and they ended up in a coma because they had to put do five surgeries to me. So four on the legs and one on the arm. I ended up being in a, a coma for the better part of a week. Uh, kidneys failed, passed away, I had figures all going through the roof, which should have killed like a normal person. But um, I woke up a week later and uh, I was in the hospital bed, all opened up and uh, on this huge filtration machine, which was doing the job of my kidneys and they had four or five different machines doing different jobs for the important organs in my body. 
yeah and then really the the real work began from there really and so i just want to stop you there from that moment so you've gone through all of this and your background is as a martial artist your life is martial arts um what was going through your mind as you're there with these sorts of injuries and dealing with you know kidney failure and such knowing that you know sports and martial arts is basically your life the martial arts, because it's not something I, I do like twice a week for an hour or something, uh, it's something that I am or try to be. I try and live the martial arts mindset and the ethos, not just physically, but uh, emotionally and spiritually. So dealing with, I mean, you've done it uh, plenty yourself. So, de- you know, you are constantly losing on the map, being in a bad situation, tapping out, getting beaten up, inspiring and things like this. These are normal everyday occurrences and you've got to not have an attachment to what's happening to you, right? Because uh, that that gets in the way. You get in your own way ultimately. And you know, I've done this long enough and allowed the the lessons, you know, to permeate into my being. I lived that way all the time. So when I woke up from that surgery, I still had a tube in my mouth and I was completely calm. The doctors were worried because usually when uh, guys wake up from a coma and they've got the tube in their mouth, they try and rip it out. Um, I was completely calm. I asked for a, a notepad and pen wrote down the first thing that any responsible son would do and said, uh, don't tell my mom. <laughs> <laughs> that was the first thing on mine. And then the next thing was I saw a couple of my friends there, you know, close ones to me, and that they were there in the whole week that I was in the coma. And the next thing I was, said was, let's start the rehab. Not, you know, oh, you know, woe is me. This is the end of my martial arts career, this and that and all the rest of it. Never really crossed my mind. Honestly, not for a second. I, I got up and I said, when do I start the rehab? And they were like, look, your kidneys, they're never going to come back online, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Literally just shrugged my shoulders. I said, take this tube out and let's get going. And then what happened next? Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> the journey was not smooth, my friend. Um, trying to recall everything because there's so much. Literally, it was the, the literal rolling with the punches. Every single day brought a new drama, a new piece of crap news. I mean, I, I couldn't sit up. I couldn't move because um, I had all these uh, open incisions. I was weeping everywhere into this bed. So the bed would get completely uh, soggy every 30 minutes. And they'd have to clean the wounds every three hours. It was a particularly uncomfortable situation. Uh, because of all the concoction of drugs they had me on, I was feeling sick all the time and I couldn't really, I felt really despondent. I felt completely uh, not connected with myself, if that makes sense. So what did they have? Did they have you on very powerful drugs? Was that the issue? The most powerful drugs, in fact, because uh, you've, you've got to imagine that uh, I've gone through these five surgeries. So I've got open wounds and I'm lying in a bed. They had me on this stuff called um, milk of amnesia when I was in the coma. So coming off that was was really quite strange because it's to stop you thinking and dreaming when you're in the coma. Okay. But I had a ridiculous experience, and I remember everything for those uh, seven days I was in there. But that's, that goes beyond the scope of this podcast. I'll talk to you about that after. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, yeah, it was day-to-day. I, was, I started off literally the rehab was just wiggling my toes, wiggling my toes and just trying to keep food down. And it was just a day-to-day process every single day. The doctor would come in or a nurse would come in and say, we've got some bad news for you today. You know, uh, the, the kidneys are, you know, you've got to be on this filtration machine. So you've got dialysis, which I'm sure you guys are familiar with. Then you've got filtration machine, which is basically pulling blood out of your body over the course of 10 hours and returning it back into, into your body, freezing cold. So I was constantly cold the entire time. I mean, freezing cold. They, they had me on that for a better part of a week. I got sewn back up which was, uh, so I had to get back in surgery again they had to, they had to close all the incisions. Then I had to learn how to walk, basically. So they, you know, it was just day by day, get off the, can you sit up from sitting up? Can you bend your knees? Can you bend your knees? Can you sit on a chair? If you can sit on a chair, you know, then you can go to, you, you know, we get you on the Zimmer frame and we slowly get you walking. And it was literally, literally baby steps every single day. But it was, um, I don't know how to tell you, man. I was so accustomed to it. Every time I fell down, every time, you know, I, I tried to move and I couldn't, it was just leaning back to the lessons on the mat where I couldn't do a technique or I couldn't do a move or I rolled with a particular guy and he tapped me out. And I was like, okay, that's just part of the process. And how much of that do you think allowed you, so all of those lessons from martial arts over the years, allowed you to sort of keep that drive going forward saying, no, I've been here, I've been tapped out a hundred times, I've been knocked down. All you do is you get up and laugh about it and try again. Absolutely all of it. There were people, there was, I was in intensive care for the better part of a month and a half, right? So I, I, I got to see a lot of people 
who obviously hadn't had the same journey as myself. You could see that quit is not the right word in a, a word, but they just they hadn't really experienced anything at all akin to this as normal people wouldn't right so yeah. nothing to fall back on you, you know what i mean when these guys was really severe injuries and they were just laying in the bed and not moving and just pretty much accepting their fate and uh in the end i was telling the guys in the other beds like you know get the fuck up man come on let's <laughs> <laughs> let's get better yeah, let's do this right? yeah i'll be honest it reminds me a bit of that i don't know if you've ever seen that joe rogan brazilian jiu-jitsu video that he made um where he talks about that most people in life have never faced adverse adversity they've never had a fight they've never known what it's like to be dominated or anything like that you know it sounds like these are the lessons almost that he was describing i don't know have you seen that one that i'm talking about i have i have actually yeah um yeah i can completely relate with that and it really goes a step further though because it, it gets to the point where rather than try to dominate something if you try and really beat something or dominate something there comes a point where you can't right yeah that hurts even more when you can't do it i've been through that that stage and i've got to the point of neutra- neutrality really where i'm not really attaching myself to being something i'm just literally go doing the process So wiggling the toes, wiggling the fingers, seeing it as a small victory, that sort of thing. Yes, more victories. And and if it wasn't a victory, it's like, I'm just going to keep following the process. Because if I I tried to wiggle my toes one day and I couldn't, then I feel hurt. But if I couldn't wiggle my toes, I said, well, I can't wiggle my toes and that's that. And I just exhaled it out. You know, when you do a lot of good internal martial arts as well, meditation is a big part of it. And that was incredibly important for my ability to survive six weeks at looking up at the same ceiling day in and day out you know really it's not to t- and it's not to take your brain to another place it's not that at all it's to be completely in your body understand that what you're feeling are just sensations yeah and it's up to me how i decipher those sensations does, does that make sense oh completely yeah, it's. I'm not trying to run from the sensation. I'm not trying to. You know, a lot of people when they're doing like hard workouts and they put their brain somewhere else and to avoid the burn and the pain. Um, I think you're missing a trick there. I think you should be completely in that point of pain and then and then change and change your frame of reference to the pain. So, I mean, I I always like the one of. Um, you know, if you're running, your legs are feeling warm. Just be like, yeah, it's my body telling me that I'm exercising. It's telling me I'm getting nice and warmed up. You know, the sort of try and convert the pain of running in things in your legs to sort of giving it another narrative, another story. Yeah, well, I mean, it's also if you're running really hard and it's not hurting, then there's you, you're not getting anything, right? So why are you doing this? <laughs> yes, yeah, completely true. If it's not hurting. A lot of people, they'll train and they'll, they'll do things that they've always done and it feels good. It's like, well, it shouldn't feel good because if nothing's changing. Yeah, yeah, you're not put, you're not taking yourself out of your comfort zone, so nothing's growing. The, the organism changes upon with the stress imposed upon it. So if there's no stress, you're not changing, and nothing stays the same. So you're going backwards. Yeah, it's, it's such a good way of viewing it. And with that, you know, how did that then transfer into you getting through that th- that physical therapy? So I was trying to do physical things first, and I realised that. Because I was, because of the, the the drugs and the concoction they had me on, I realized that wasn't in my body as much as I could be. I, I was literally a, a mind and a body. I wasn't the, the two things in in one unit. And uh, so I requested that they they turn down my pain medication. They were like, "Look, we legally have an obligation. We can't just leave you that pain medication." And uh, so I stopped pressing the button myself because you you self administer when the pain comes in. And um, yeah, and I told them I can't do it because I need to get back into my into my body. And I do that via the breath. So then I started to go, I started to lower the, the pain medication over the course of two or three days. And it got to the point where, um, you know, like when you get cold turkey, like when a cracker comes off the cold, you know, his bugs, right? It, it was like that. I, I felt like tearing off my skin. It was, I was crawling inside my body and I just brought myself back into my breath. I stopped all the pain and the shaking and brought myself back into my breath, aligned my mind and my body. So it took about three days for that to happen. It was incredible amount of um, emotion physical pain those three days but the minute I got myself back into my body so I wasn't I wasn't separate then I could start the process of of deciphering the sensations that were going on the minute that started to happen the physical therapy improved on a daily basis of almost on an hourly basis I was there in visual um, visualizing my myself walking every single day uh, visualizing myself falling and not feeling any any which way about it 
you know, so I actually visualized the failure within. Well, yeah, I mean that that is so perfect. That's when I'm working with athletes. A lot of the time, that's exactly what we're doing. It's you're visualizing the worst case scenario and then dealing with it fine and moving forward. And it sounds like you're doing that yourself within these meditations. Yeah, it had to be done, and uh, I was literally envisioning uh, visualizing the uh, the kidneys getting better, recovering, the the sinews tying back together. So it was just like day by day, and I was up, I was, uh, and you know, momentum starts to build, right? So I was up, I was out of the bed, from the bed, um, I was walking on, on crutches on the Zimmer frame. The, the physio would say, okay, we'll go 10 steps. And I'll say, okay, but I'll do 12 or I'll do 14. Always a little bit more, always a little bit more. Um, let's go up the stairs, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And um, it was just daily progress. They were absolutely astonished, completely astonished. So, you know, um, I was up and out of that bed walking within a week or eight, eight or nine days, I think it was, eight or nine days. Um I mean, I felt really bad for this. Oh, I've forgotten the name and I'm going to have to go back in and, and give her a box of chocolates or something because uh, I would walk more than I should have. And I, there would be a trail of like blood and bodies. Oh, crying. <laughs> Someone's job to clear it up. This lady, right, she would wait for me to start walking and she would be behind me, mopping the, the floor behind me. She was a cleaner there, right? She would purposely wait for me. And I thought, wow. Yeah. And I used to apologize to her. She goes, don't be silly. At least you're not in the bed. <laughs> I, I, i'd rather clean clean all this than just watch you just soak your bed holy shit there's some real people out there you know it's just uh awesome awesome lady so you know everything's going well and i'm like okay you know th- this is good I, I, i'm in a hospital they they done their best fantastic staff and everything but there's nowhere like home right you know you, you want it's it's such a nameless faceless place you know just looking at that white ceiling all the time these green walls just like, man, I just want to sit on my couch and watch my TV and I can recover better at home, you know? So uh, I'm trying not to be too attached to the thought of going home, but you can't help it. You kind of flitter there back and forth. So um, I'm, I'm ready to go and they've come back in and the doctor's peeled away all the uh, all the bandages, right, to check out my wounds because I started to walk without the crutches and everything. And we're, I think we're, what, we're two weeks in now, I think. And um, he said, man, there's a, there's a pungent smell coming from you, right? Thinking in my head, I haven't showered the last couple of days, you'd stink too. Pulled the, the bandages away and he said, shit, pulled off all the bandages and he said, you've got some kind of weird flesh-eating disease. That's You've got an infection, basically. Uh, and we've got to take you back into surgery. We've got to open open you up all over again. Back in the surgery, I went, man. You put me back in. They, they've done all the five surgeries all over again. Uh, pull me back out. And I've had to start from square one all over again. Uh, had to learn how to walk again. Had to, uh, you know, had to, had to wait for the uh, the incisions to close to, to to close up and everything. And just going back to that moment, mm. was it something where when you realised that was going to happen, you're going to have to go through this painful process of relearning again, having only just done it, mm. that you were thinking, I know I can do this now because I've just done it. Exactly. Or was it so? Is that was it that positive mindset of well, clearly I know the structure now. I've got through this once two weeks ago. Yeah, ex- exactly that. It was it was a gut punch. I'm not going to lie to you, it was a gut punch. But it was literally, you know, you can get hit and then take the full shot. You can hit and you can roll with it, Mayweather style. Mm. And that's what it was. I just rolled with it and it was gone. As quick as the the gut punch came, it went. Just you know, I, I became. I got a little bit too attached to the idea of going home and everything. And uh, the minute it wasn't there and it was out of my grasp, it was just literally back down to business as usual. I had an even stronger conviction this time because, like you rightly said, you know, it's been done before. Um, the the parameter is a little bit different this time, though, because they had to cut away so much flesh and skin that, and they couldn't graft any on because there wasn't any left. So they had to go through a different healing process thousands of staples in the leg and all that kind of stuff. I don't know. It just didn't, it didn't really bother. I tell you what, what, what bothered me is the impact it had on other people. You know, my, my oh, so, so they weren't as mentally prepared for it as you were in some way. It was nobody did. Well, when I was in the coma on Wednesday, they called my, my loved ones in and they said, look, he's not, he's not getting up on Thursday. He's had a heart rate of 180 beats per minute for 20 hours. He's going to die. So you bet you might as well come in and say your goodbyes. Next thing you know, I've, I've made it through. And so, all the whole process that they went through watching me, it still actually bothers me now. I can't, it's easy for me to let go of the situation as it happened to me, but not how it affected other people. Mm. I can still see it in my mother's eyes. Sometimes I go and see her and she's like, I hope you're not training too hard and this and that. And I can see like, 
man, you know, you got hurt by this situation, of course, but, you know, she'd been through a lot in her life and I didn't want to, you know, be, you know, add to that, you know, so really how it was bothering other people was more, uh, more on my mind than how it was bothering me. To me, it was just a process. Just go through the process, rinse and repeat every single day, go to sleep, get up, start your rehab, visualize, eat your food. Do the process, you know, uh, don't listen to what the doctor's saying. They're saying you're finished, you're done, no more martial arts for you. You know, you've got this weird condition. So the condition basically is, is a muscular autoimmune disease where if I, you know, when you train and your muscle tissue breaks down and then it builds back up afterwards, yeah, continually breaks down. My body doesn't know how to process energy, apparently, in the mitochondria, uh, as I understand it. And it just continually breaks down and breaks down and breaks down. And then you start excreting bits of muscle out. And then your body becomes toxic and it decides to try and force feed fluid to clean the muscle. And that's what causes something called rhabdomyolysis, which causes the legs to implode, explode, whichever you want to see it. Yeah, anytime I'm doing anything, because I'm still, I'm active. Ever, the minute I came out of the hospital, I went straight back to training. So just step back. So how was that second process of recovery? What did that look like? How long did that take? Rinse and repeat. So I'll, it took a little bit longer because actually getting out of the bed was quicker. Right, getting out of the bed was quicker because uh, the staff also uh, was used to what they were dealing with now. <laughs> we're not, not going to slow this guy down. <laughs> not at all. And uh, they knew that slowing me down was the problem. They realized that I wasn't just gung ho about it, uh, attacking the situation as cerebrally as, as I could. I knew my limits, though. They didn't know my limits. But then after a few, you know, two or three weeks of being with me, they knew my limits. You know, pain wasn't really the issue how i felt as well you know it was strange doctors would come in every day and ask how i was feeling and i thought what a what a strange question to ask me how am i feeling who cares you know my feelings are irrelevant i'm i want to get better yeah the feet that's the problem feelings and people's brains and this we, we're all in this this new age mindset so it's how you feel that matters no it doesn't how i feel about something today would be completely different to how i feel about something next year right so, I mean, was it real in the first place? That that doesn't really hold too much stock with me as such. Yeah, most people's feelings anyway, or, or my feelings in that circumstance. My, my goal was more uh, going through the process and achieving what I wanted to, which was to recover, was more important to me than how I felt, if that makes any sense. Oh, completely. And And then sort of you got to that process and when did you get the, okay, Vic, you can go home. What was that like? So the kidneys were still smashed. So um, I was getting the physical movements and I was walking and everything and doing some squats. I, I do a lot of traditional uh, breathing like qigong and, and yoga and stuff like that. And I, I have no doubt that was the difference with helping me recover. So I'm sitting in bed and the doctor has come in and um, he says, look, we've got this uh, amazing news for you, right? And I said, yeah. He said, we heard you went, you know, you went for a pee the other day. You went to the toilet. I said, yeah. Um, by yourself. I'm like, yeah. He goes, man, that's impossible. You can't be able to do it because you've got no kidneys and blah, blah. And I said, you know, I've been going for the last couple of days. I've never, <laughs> never, I've never seen a bunch of people so happy to see a grown adult use a toilet by himself. And they came back in and they said, look, man, your kidneys, they're, they're back online. They're working, right? From I was, I was staring at dialysis with the uh, next move being a kidney transplant. And they're turning around and saying, listen, you're – you're completely fine, not completely fine, but you're well on the road to recover. Your kidneys are all cool. And um, I remember uh, looking at the doctor's name was LJ. And uh, I said, yeah, thanks. And that was, what was that? You know, you should be super happy and everything. And I said, well, you're super happy because you had it in your head that they were never going to work again. And I had it in my head that I was going to follow the process and see what happens. Yeah, so you had a different expectation. Exactly that. So... You know, I, I was happy that he was happy, really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. I got out of the bed and uh, I was I was pretty nonchalant about the whole thing because I'd gone every single day. You've got to understand, every single day they were just telling me a p another piece of bad news. I was literally expecting to get to the exit door and for them to be running down to say, oh, we've got to pull you back in because something else has gone wrong with you. So it wasn't until I hit that London street and I felt the cold air. I thought, oh, this is good. This is good. Uh, you know. It's good to be alive kind of thing, right? Uh, sat in my friend's car and I said, take me to my mother's. First thing I want to do is go see my mom. 
and I don't, and uh, I wanted to see her, want her to see me not on crutches and and walking normally. I, I had a bit of a limp, but you know, couldn't be helped. I, I didn't really dwell on it too much. In fact, I had to I had to rein myself in because I was thinking about all the things I was gonna do. Right? Yeah, I'm gonna do this now. I'm gonna do that. Different bits of work and training and everything I was gonna do. And I just had to reel myself in and just say, Vic, one step at a time. You know, you, you can barely do a flight of stairs at the moment. Just went saw my mum parents are the archetype for my kind of thinking i think you know they went through a lot um you know just uh, coming here from their home country and uh, my dad had lots of um ailments my mum had to look after him before he passed away he had like four heart attacks but he had so many illnesses but every single morning i would see him get up early do some kind of prayer and meditation sit-ups and squats and push-ups until almost the day he died so i think seeing that kind of work ethic was burned into my brain uh, and the martial arts really galvanized it yes yeah, so after after seeing all the family and everything uh it was just an, the next step was just re- rehab um how was i going to build my body back up again because uh i couldn't even do a push-up i tried i went into the living room tried my first push-up and i literally fell flat on my face and, and like with everything i just if i couldn't do something i just regressed it down to its simplest and just built it up from there anything i couldn't do just regressed it down, build it, and just build it up from there until I think, I don't know, three weeks after that, I broke a Guinness Book of Records for the most amount of punches with a single arm in, in, in a minute. And just thinking about that, so you've gone through all of this. At what stage did you say, also, in a month, I'm going to try and break a Guinness Book of World Records? By not being goal driven, it's nice to have those goals. And mainly those goals. Not so much for myself because I, I'm, I was comfortable in the fact that I was going to follow this process and, and get better. But like I, I mentioned earlier, it was, it was everybody else that was around me, treating me with kid gloves and were worried about me. So I said, well, look, I'm going to do something that will show everybody that I am, if not 100%, I'm well on the way to being completely mended. And secondly, uh, I wanted to attach it to a goal bigger than myself. So, I mean, I, I raised a, a particular amount of money for the condition that I have because there's not too much information on it. Mm. And uh, it, it really hit home when I was in the intensive care and there was other people. They didn't have, you know, the ability to, to, to handle what was happening to them. And I thought, well, you know, if they had more research, more money or, or whatever, you know, they, they would be able to deal with the situation easier. So I, that's when the idea came to my head when I was in the hospital. When I get out, I'm going to do something and raise some money to to put towards this illness that nobody knows anything about, you know, help my, my, my suffering can be other people's help, right? You could help other people. And so you tell your friends and family, Hey, I'm, I'm going to go for a Guinness book of records. <laughs> Most punches thrown in a minute. What, um, what did they respond when you said that? Or do they just, they just know it. I didn't tell them until last, to a couple of days before I was going to do it. Man. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's excellent. And then yeah, talk us through that. Yeah, so that was just like, I just went back into the process. Of, oh, man, you know, first of all, I, again, you're just a ball of energy, right? It, which was difficult because my, my mind was full of energy. But when you've just had your kidneys destroyed and they're coming back online, you actually don't have any kind of muscular contraction. I mean, I, I was probably in one of the best shapes of my life prior to this. I was like night three kilo, like ripped, really good shape, quite happy with myself. And I came out of the hospital at 79 kilo and all of my muscle had been cannibalized off my body. And the kidneys themselves, because they were, they, they took such a beating, the muscles wouldn't contract. So in my head, I was like, yeah, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And I tried to do a push up and I couldn't even. <laughs> do one, right? So it was just a slow, gradual process. And I was, I remember I had to like train because obviously everybody was treating me with kid gloves. I had to train when no one was around. So they wouldn't stop me from doing it or I'll go, I'd say, oh, I've got to go to the toilet and I'll be there like trying to throw punches at the mirror and shit like that, you know, uh, just going through different protocols in my mind, see which one my body responded to uh, because my body wasn't responding to anything the same way it would before. And then, yeah, just, just gradually built it up. And uh, I actually hadn't, hadn't beaten the numbers up until the day that I attempted it. Um, I think the, the record at the time was something like 300 and, 79 or something like that or no was it 355 or something and i was around about that that number but the i knew that on the day with people there and people watching and the cameras there and everything that extra bit of oomph will will get me through so i think i'll beat the record by about four or five punches 
which was okay, but I, I would have. I'm trying again to try again. I, I think we'll give you that. <laughs> <laughs> three weeks after coming out of hospital for the second time, yeah, I think I think beating the world record by three or four punches is it's all right. <laughs> and try get a, a larger number this time, but yeah, we'll see how it goes. Man, so you get that Guinness, and how did the family and friends respond when they saw that? That you know, clearly you're back on the road to recovery if you're you're breaking records. The thing is, I never. I mean, luckily. Um, or unlikely, I don't know how. I mean, so I had videos and pictures taken of me when I was when I was in the hospital, mm. but I didn't go through what they went through. Despite me being on the road to recovery, they were still and still are just so worried because the condition is is training based. If any kind of training that I do can set off my condition, really, in some cases, people carrying their shopping up the stairs has set off the condition. I'm really you know, dodging bullets here, I'm walking a fine line, but I can't live with what might happen, right? You know, I can't live in the future. Uh, I'm not going to be stuck in the past. I can only deal with the present moment, which was, you know, really, really integral to me surviving and recovering in, in the hospital as well. You know, I couldn't be, I couldn't put my brain in, oh no, you know, my kidney's never going to work again. I'm never going to walk again. And I couldn't put my, my head to the point where you know in the place where everybody was which is oh look what just happened to me it was horrible i didn't entertain either one of those i i only dealt with how yeah, i'm i'm here today i'm wiggling my toes i'm literally here in this in this second in this moment yeah it was moment to moment that's why i was really big on bringing everything back down to the breath because that is you can't breathe in the future, right? <laughs> in the past, right? So I was everything was in, in the breath. I went back down to basics of martial arts, um, and uh, you know, I just I, I couldn't afford to put myself, you know, in the past or in the future. It's just always in the moment, and that and that's how I stayed ever since I've come out. You know, I knew it. There's things that you know, right, in, in your life, but you don't know, you, yeah. sense, right? And then completely. you go through something. And then you use that and it gets you through it. Now you know it's in your cells. And that was one of the things that, you know, I thought was just so interesting in this story is you were talking at the beginning about with the exercise, you know, if you don't feel the pain, how are you going to change? How are you going to grow? That's how the org organism develops, gets better. You've gone through an incredible process here of pain and struggle and mental fight and then being taken back to the beginning. What sort of growth do you feel that you've had as, as Vic from going through this? There were things that I knew uh, only on an intellectual level. Now there's things that I know in every fiber of my being. That was the main thing. You know, I've been on this path, internal path, as you, uh, if you like, you know, um, I've gone through all the the things that a young man does, right? You know, uh, they want things for particular reasons and, you know, everything's quite, it becomes like an accumulation of things. You spend all your time, I'm, I'm generalizing it, but you spend most of your time as a young man up until you're 30, just accumulating, accumulating, I want this, I want that, I want to do this, I want to do that. And I've been going over the past, you know, seven or eight years through this process of simplifying, uh, uh, like a, how can I describe it? You know, like an artist when he gets a whole load of clay, chisels away, it, and the, the true form is underneath, and that's what that's what the end result is. Was never finished, but you, you get to see where I'm coming from, and that's what my whole life's been working towards, All right? But I, I, so I knew things on an intellectual level, but going through this process has allowed me to, how can I describe it? You know, some people they know in the, they think they know that there's an actual God. But they don't know it really. But unless God was to come down, like whoever, Jesus, whatever, came down and you met him, that would ch you might be a good Christian, but until you met Jesus. But, but if, you, if you met Jesus, you'd be a very good Christian. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. exactly right. Now you, you knew before, but now you know, right? And that's pretty much the, the missing piece for me, as it were, right? So I haven't really seen it as a bad thing at all. When I was in the hospital, it was an opportunity to see if I'm the real deal. So is it almost testing your internal martial arts as well? Because obviously a lot of people be practice these breathing exercises and things, but it's very rare that anyone has one of those opportunities to actually say, you know, I believe this can help to heal my body. The doctors are now in shock. Yeah, but I don't think you need a life and death situation. <laughs> I think people every day have an opportunity to train. You know, that spouse that's annoyed you. You can exhale it out. You don't have to deal with it the way that you are. That you know that piece of work, that guy that's cut you up on the road, 
that piece of training, that piece of stress that's happened to you, or, you know, all the things, there's so many opportunities, right? Uh, in the day that you, you, you can train, there are opportunities yeah, that you can test your, your stuff, right? You know, that's how I see it. So this was just a, a big opportunity. Obviously there was a lesson that I hadn't really was too thick to understand until I went through a life and death situation, which I've now got. So, <laughs> <laughs> and, and now you're sharing that message. That's been the biggest gift of this entire thing, right? Oh, man, the impact that this has had on other people, I, I never, I never thought, you know, to me, it was just following a process and doing what I needed to do. But the amount of people that this has helped, man, it's been quite easy to say the whole thing's been worth it. Man, and that's, that's incredible um, to hear. And, you know, the whole story, I just, obviously, you know, I, I know Vic from before, um, you know, I've sort of, done a little bit of work with your mindset for martial arts and things years ago and i was watching this on facebook as you released those video blogs initially and it was just so inspiring to watch the recovery and then seeing that convert into a um into a world record it was just absolutely incredible to look at from the outside and i truly think it shows a level of mental toughness that even with someone who's effectively working in the mental toughness industry like i do um really takes it to, to a level that's rarely seen. I appreciate that. I think people would surprise themselves. Maybe, I don't know, I, I can't comment about about that. Yeah, I think people are stronger than they give themselves credit for, you know? It's just, uh, I don't know, I was too stubborn to die. Well, I think that's, that's a good tagline. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to use that as the title for, for today's <laughs> podcast. <laughs> too stubborn to die. <laughs> Well, man, um, and where, if people want to find out about your martial arts teaching or follow your journey or anything like that, where can they find you? You can always go to my Facebook page, VRK space HFTHI, Vikothi, or they can go to my, uh, uh, I've got my martial arts uh, organization, IMAS, I-M-A-S hyphen UK.com. And there's a IMAS uh, Facebook page as well. Um, any one of those, they can find out more from, and also, if anybody has found themselves in a similar situation, um, they can feel free to hit me up anytime. Uh, I've got absolutely no no qualms about talking to people uh, and sharing uh, what I what I went through, what I knew. To, if, it, if it helps them, you know, just get up into gear and get get on with getting better. So, man, that's really really awesome. And what we'll do is I'll also put up links on the podcast page so you can find Vic easily enough. And um, also, I'll, I'll put a link to where you've got the YouTube videos, which is where I saw this story initially play out as well. So if someone wants to watch those videos, seeing you pictures of how it all worked and the record and things like that, um, I'll make sure that all of that's available as well. So, man, once again, thank you so much for coming on and um, thank you for being too stubborn to die. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Awesome, man. Uh, I'll talk to you soon. Yes. So really inspirational stuff there from Vic. I, I truly believe his story should be going viral. So if you want to share that one with people or share his videos, please do it. I think just so many people could learn a ton from seeing how mental toughness in that health-related situation had just such a huge impact on his ability to recover. So I hope you all enjoyed the episode and catch us next week uh, with another guest. Talk to you soon.